I've mod modified a little. Okay, good. In order to visualize spatial data, we could just visualize the geometries. And that works. So that in uh, all of the approaches which we'll be looking at, you can show just the geometries. If you visualize just geometries or geometries with no uh, known attribute, say in map view, then you get them filled in in a sort of a sort of blue purple color. It just just fills in the geometries. Uh, if you're visualizing lines in map view, they get shown as lines. Points get shown by by a, a symbol, and it's possible to change the symbol if if, if necessary. However, most uh, use of uh, visualization in uh, in statistical cartography is thematic mapping. Now, it could be thematic mapping dealing with situations where one uses, say, for a categorical variable, different symbols to represent different uh, different kinds of of um, uh, values. It could also be the situation that used the same symbol but with a different color to represent distinct classes of, of entities. A specific uh, difficulty is representing uh, uh, space-time data, partly because if you try to represent a dense filled display, then you need three dimensions or you need to uh, create a... a um, uh, an animated visualization in order to to, to observe this. Uh, before I get into class intervals, which are Im important for important for thematic cartography, perhaps I should mention a concern in more general terms, not just for cartography, which is that um, in the 1980s, a good deal of work was done on the um, the cognitive side of data visualization, among other things, by Bill Cleveland at Bell Laboratories and, and others. Now, at that stage, one knew a good deal about how many graphical uh, objects or entities uh, the viewer of a plot could grasp. The number was not very large. It's about the same as the number that you could grasp in one view of a table, and the number was about nine. So that a three by three table, uh, people could look at the table and get a, an overview. Six is easier. Nine is quite hard, but just looking at it, you get a picture of what the relative, uh, relative sizes are. Once you go over that, then the... the um, focus of the eyes moves to a particular column, a particular row, a row of sums, a row of, uh, a, a row of, uh, uh, of column sums, a column of row sums. Uh, but without sort of then diving into the table, most uh, homo sapiens don't, don't cut it. With graphical displays, many of the same features apply, so that both in Edward Tufter's work as the data to ink ratio is something which which Tufta stressed, uh, is that you want to try to minimize extraneous uh, details because those are the ones which may absorb the attention of the viewer of, of the graphic. Now, in many maps, we're looking at potentially. So a map of counties in the U.S. state, you're looking at from many tens to hundreds of counties. Looking at all of the counties in the U.S., you're looking at 3,000. Looking at nuts, say nuts three regions in Europe, you're looking at, at um, a large number. Looking at municipalities in Norway, you're looking at a well over 400. And the possibility that your view of the data will be uh, either knowingly or not knowingly misled is relatively large. Uh, what triggered my reflection on this was animation, because with animation we just do not know what happens. 
uh, although the hands wrestling displays with bubbles moving in different directions, we've all seen them, and, and they all communicate. It's just that we don't know whether they communicate the same thing to all observers. Now, if you're not colorblind, you will probably find that your eyeballs track the red bubbles and don't track the gray ones. You may not be conscious of them doing this, but they'll be doing it anyway because that's the way the, the visual cognitive system for people who aren't colorblind is constructed. If you are colorblind, you may find that, that a, color, a colorblind observer, one of three different classes of colorblind observers, may see something rather different in the data which they're being present, with which they're being presented. And very much the same thing would apply to other kinds of data unless uh, there are cognitive keys which uh, indicate that you, you're sort of used to observing them, uh, that you can unlock the problem. Uh, you will probably have seen the um, media attention to the apparent misunderstanding of whether a hurricane was going to track over Alabama in the view of the US president. Now, it could be that it was just fake news and that he needed to support a candidate or a friend in Alabama. But it could also be that actually the data graphic is quite complicated. And when you're presenting uh, uh, the cone of hurricane tracks, it's actually quite difficult to grasp what is actually going on in the display. Uh, so that when we're designing uh, maps for display, uh, I do feel sometimes that that we spend uh, a large proportion of time creating something which we feel looks nice subjectively, which is great, but we have relatively little focus on the 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 uh, um, the way in which viewers of the graphic uh, comprehend it. You're probably aware that uh, the visual system predates language by at least... So if language has existed in half, for half a million years, the visual system has existed for half a thousand million years at least, and probably more. Dinosaurs had pretty good eyes too, so probably better than ours. So, so the, the visual system, so how do you react to, to visual uh, stimuli? This is something which goes straight into processing without having been thought about too much, and then we think about it once it's come out again. So that we're, we're, our eyes are identifying patterns uh, before we've even realized that that's what they're doing. Uh, whereas if we're presenting uh, tabular material or text, hopefully, the viewer is either so bored that they don't bother to read the text, but at least if it's going through their uh, cognitive system, the text takes much more effort to comprehend. Uh, so that when we're designing or visualizing data, then I think it, it's appropriate to, to pay attention to some of, some, of, some of these issues. One of them leads to a particular uh, conundrum, which is that cartographers in general... Uh, would prefer to have a small number of classes so that if one is, is uh, discretizing continuously valued data in order to present it as, as uh, lower values and higher values and middling values, say in seven classes or even nine classes, remembering that we can, we can perceive about nine things in a table, I can I can see the reason for that, but I can't see the reason for some for, for, for the use of a continuous color scale where going from the display to the legend to read off that's a tabular lookup to read off uh, which of the spatial entities belongs to which of the categories. Now with categorical data, then this is relatively uh, relatively okay because we, when we're looking at, at, at categorical data, we've got a, a limited number of categories which are there. Land, land use, land cover maps are 
difficult to use because you may be going into about 40 different categories. They are in hierarchies. But reading off exactly which kind of deciduous or coniferous woodland is represented between two different shades of dark green is taxing for most people. So that even in displaying things where there is a, if you like, a standard lookup table for, 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 for the categories is, is hard. And it may be helpful that if for your purposes you need to uh, you need to present land use categories. It may be sensible to simply to aggregate the ones which are of less interest for your purposes. So you don't necessarily need to differentiate between residential and industrial if you're trying to display uh, display data which uh, which for which uh, the the kind of uh, urban uh, land land cover is is irrelevant. So just, just make all of the urban stuff grey, be done with it. And then you can concentrate on, 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 on what matters for, you, for your analysis. It's also the case that if you're dealing with relatively homogeneous areas, then it may be that the differences between the standard colours are not really big enough and that you perhaps need to enhance those or choose a separate palette for the categories that, that you're using. But with categories, at least you don't have to discretize the, the data themselves. It is probably a good idea where you're dealing with, with ordinal data, which are categorical but ordered, uh, to use um, colors which reflect that, or cho choose a palette which reflects the, the ordering, so that using a categorical palette when the data they're not um, they're not um, uh, they can't be mapped onto onto the real line okay so we don't know what the metric is but we know that one is lighter and the other one is darker so that we would probably want to want to chop them up in 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 in, in that kind of in that kind of way so that there are there are a range of of um, I think I think the, these are the problems the computer that's the problem when when we all just had to draw draft is the correct word draft maps by hand you thought for quite a long time before you committed your pen to foil but the computers make it so easy. <laughs> And then you say, ah, it's a map. Good, off it goes. Uh, and it's done. And, and we don't spend enough time thinking about uh, how to, to actually communicate the message which we're embedding in, in, in that display. And that, I think, would be, would be helpful. And we don't really have tools for doing that. So that, that almost all of the discussions, there's, there's an enormous amount of traffic on Stack Overflow with regard to ggplot, for example. But almost all of it are questions about uh, how can I uh, tweak a particular uh, feature of the display. Almost none of it is on how the display is observed by uh, the, uh, the, the recipient of the message, which I think is a bit of a shame. Many mapping settings have, have fairly clear standards so that you can, you can look at what other people have done in your field of study and, and you'll be moving off in more or less the same, same general direction. But there's an awful lot of, of, of work produced which are just accepting defaults. They're accepting defaults for how to do stuff. And there is the possibility that, that one can communicate the content better by uh, thinking more clearly about it. Uh, colors are one or palettes are one thing, and I'll come back to palettes uh, in, in, in a moment, but I'd like to talk first about class intervals. Uh, I got pushed into the class int package in 2007 without planning it, but I sort of realized giving a workshop in, in so, so southwest Britain or southwest England that, that we actually did need something like that. Uh, so uh, the Class in package provides a, a standard set of tools for addressing uh, the, 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 the 
problems which arise in trying to design class intervals for, in particular for thematic mapping when the variable we're considering is continuous, so that the, the variable could have been observed on the real line. For categorical maps, then the, there, are, there are other concerns because we don't need to uh, discretize them into, into classes. But for, this, is, this is then something like clustering in one dimension. Uh, and there are a whole series of, of ways in which this, the, this could potentially be done. So in the class int uh, package, there's a function called class intervals. These are the arguments to, to that, uh, to that uh, function. So it takes the variable of interest, and the variable of interest can be of arbitrary length, but if it's longer than 3,000, it will be subsampled. So that, that we need at least 3,000 3, values to get a good guess but uh, once we go over that then we're doing 3,000 plus 10 percent of what's above that because if you've got uh, hundreds of thousands it would take too long yes that's a good question um, do you have a, a github account you don't have to. If you don't, then just send me a message through Canvas or something. But I, I'd, I'd need to check that. Uh, my impression is that it did, uh, but I, I need to check that. So I, I could hop out of this and go into the code and check, and, and I could probably do that at 3 o'clock, but, but to, so raise my attention in some way to, to, to check that. Uh, in QGIS as well, there's a, the, they take 3,000. ArcGIS is the, same, is the same problem because they don't want to do natural breaks, which is computationally quite intensive, um, if you've got very many values. Uh, also, the sample... Uh, varies depending on the seed of the random number generator. So that if you set the seed of the random number generator to a different value, then you get a slightly different uh, set of class intervals. But, but the problem you raise is, 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 is significant. I, I, I know that I've been there, uh, but I'm not sure whether when we added the sampling earlier this year after 12 years of not bothering, um, when STARS was being developed, then we found out that STARS was going to use this procedure, and if it did, then with big rasters, then, then it, was, it, was, it was the wrong thing to do. Uh, we've got the, num the, the, the number of classes we'd like to get, N, but the number of classes we'd like to get is not always the number of classes that come out. It's sometimes if we say that the style is pretty and not quantile, and pretty can give us a pretty our numbers like last century technology, like banknotes. So you've got tens, twenties, fifties, hundreds, two hundreds, five hundreds. Those are pretty numbers. So it would divide up by some multiple of that. So it would say that the basic uh, the basic step in the data, so if we want say about five classes and the data span a range of, say, from um, 50 to 5,000, then what step would we, think would we need? In that case, probably you'd need a step of 1,000. So you get 5 out. So we'd go 0 to 1,000, not to 999, Point nine 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 thousand to that's the next thing. Are we doing interval closure left or right? And we also need to choose whether we're doing interval closure left or right. Is it going to be from the smallest number to one thousand, then from one thousand point not 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 one up, or are we going to nine hundred ninety nine point nine 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 nine? It's closed. Uh, there and the next one starts at the, at the even number so we, we need to decide uh, the interval closure by default it's left uh, the data precision can also be set uh, interval closure and data precision were uh, largely implemented by uh, people working at the World Health Organization no, sorry, the, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization of the, of, the, of the United Nations. 
uh, in 2011, they started automating the preparation of their statistical yearbooks, and they were using LaTeX and R, and then in for doing the maps, they were using uh, SP and, and so on. Uh, so they said, well, we actually need much better control of the data precision because in some schemes you get large number of digits after the decimal place, and that's not a good idea, so we want something which is is shorter, but which might mean that you change the classification of, you don't just want to round the legend, you need to round the legend and then feed it back to change over the classifications internally. So the, 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 the data precision needs to be, needs to be handled uh, carefully. Uh, there are a number of uh, extra arguments which can be passed through, which feed through to style. R times is a bit, uh, uh, pro probably it should be in, in, the, in the three dots. Uh, it applies to some of the randomization procedures where you need to have several, several attempts because it doesn't work the, the first time, so you need to, have a, need to, to, to randomize things. Okay, so the data set we'll use is, is uh, from leprosy surveillance in Alinda in Brazil. So it's a data set we use, we use in the book as well. Um, and the, the data are in the, in the zip file. There's also a tutorial uh, which is uh, there from a, a week workshop in Glasgow in, in August. And this is referring back to a tutorial which I wrote in, in 2000, or which uh, I wrote with Marilio Sacavallo. Uh, who was the source of the the original data, which describes the the whole setting for for for, for using the data sets. So okay, so we can read in the data using using SF. Uh, this is a, again a geo package reading in the data set. We've got two hundred and forty three features. They've got uh, fields, uh, and one of the variables, it's a continuous variable based on the census, is deprivation. So you've got a deprivation variable, and we'll produce a class interval object uh, here, CI, uh, with the variable of interest. We want seven, and we want to use the style of Fisher. It could be Fisher Jenks. Jenks uses an interpreted code. Fisher uses the original Fortran code uh, from uh, the original implementation. So the, 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 the one which is sort of the, the great grandfather of all of the other implementations. Uh, the idea of natural breaks, Fisher method, Fisher Jenks method, is that uh, in some sense, and that for the criteria which are used in the algorithm, uh, one uh, reduces the within group variability and increases the between group variability. This is quite like uh, univariate clustering in general. And uh, you can use a hierarchical clustering style, you can use a k-means style, and those are also available here. And b-clust is probably the one which, uh, which is closest to natural breaks, but which has a statistical background rather than a cartographic background. But, okay, so we've got our class, class interval object, uh, and when you print it out, the print method for the object displays the style, that's how it was calculated, and then the uh, lower and upper bounds, lower and upper bounds. Here we've got the left closure. So here we were, were displaying the, 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 the values which would fall into the classes and the counts of values in each of the, each, in each of the classes. Unfortunately, the, with this, this level of, perhaps, if we go out like that, yeah, okay. Is that still legible? It's still legible. At least it doesn't fold the, 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 the output uh, to the same extent. So the, now here we've got the, the seven classes and we've got the class intervals. And it's quite hard from the printout to see how broad the classes are in relation to each other. We can see that, the, that this class is definitely the largest with 53 uh, census tracts. There are quite a number with between 30 and 40, and there are two between 20 and 30 members in using this algorithm. If we'd used a, another algorithm, either bag clustering or hierarchical clustering or k-means or 
one or other of the others, then we would probably have got slightly different numbers in, in the classes. But this is, this is a, a class interval method, which is uh, attempting relatively, uh, relatively um, definitely, it's trying hard, to um, first to choose, as in k-means, to choose where are the centers of clusters, and then which edge of cluster observation should be moved to a different cluster in order to optimize the um, uh, within group small and between group large variances. Uh, we can also uh, uh, display this. There's a plot method, but the plot method typically likes to have a palette uh, giving us the 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 the, uh, the 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 colors which would be used if it, if this was plotted, and here I'm going to use the our color brewer uh, reds. Uh, how many of you are familiar with color brewer? Uh, so there's the two, two, three. Yeah, color brewer is also used in lots of other settings, not just for maps. Uh, but if you visit uh, colorbrewer.org. Uh, you, you'll find that it's it's really useful. Colorbrewer.org uh, is the work of Cynthia Brewer with with uh, collaborators and was uh, originally uh, designed using a considerable amount of resources on cognitive studies for the U.S. Sense, uh, the U.S. Uh, Cancer Atlas, and the idea was to find color palettes which were communicative but not too scary as in many circumstances uh, MATLAB uh, uh, other programs will just use straight rainbow and straight rainbow is about the the, the least communicative you could possibly choose um, for reasons which we can return to if need be but uh, color brewer has been around in our the or the our color brewer package has been around for for certainly about 15 years maybe about 15 years and uh, is 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 very very uh, very worthwhile uh, i will uh, go out to this one this is the color brewer website and it permits you to choose this is, these are multi-hue, single hue. These are multi-hue. These are single hue. Uh, we could... This is the three-class orange. We can increase the number of classes. But here, um, Color Bro will only give us nine. It says that you can't distinguish between the colors if you're using more than nine. There are one or two of these which will give you one or two more. That's, that also cuts off at nine. Sorry? Uh, yes, but then, then you're going in two different directions. So, so, so he, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. So we can get to 11 with this one, which is the uh, uh, um, brown, blue, green, brown, bluey green color. Uh, and you also get marks showing which displays work. So that if we choose, say, something like this, we'll find that uh, it doesn't really work for colorblind people uh, because the greens and the reds, for, for the typical colorblindness, then the greens and the reds will, will, uh, uh, will intervene. But it, it is possible to find um, displays which work for colorblind people and things like this. Uh, it's also possible to change, uh, choose the qualitative palettes. Uh, there are only, or no, you can get as far as twelve, and there there are two which are which are which are provided: set three and paired. Um, and paired then has a light blue, dark blue, light green, uh, dark green, pink, red light orange, dark orange, and so on, so that it, they're in, in, in pairs. Uh, if we drop further down to this one, we, we get many more uh, qualitative, and they would typically be used for, for categorical variables rather than... than, uh, than, uh, than. But sequential, the understanding is that it goes from uh, low with uh, low intensity to highest high intensity. 
and uh, our color brewer gives access to the name of the class here so that the one we were using there was reds and we've chosen uh, one less than the number of class intervals so it was either this 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 number of values and and you can see that that cognitively you can see the difference between the uh, between the um, uh, between the um, uh, barriers uh, it's also possible to play with uh, transparency or is it yep okay so we can play with transparency so color brew is certainly if you uh, are sitting at an airport with a good internet connection and there's no way we've got Eduroam at airport, so that's great. So uh, it, it's possible to sort of create some really quite, uh, really quite nice, ni ni nice things. So color, color brewer is certainly worth uh, worth exploring some of the so, so some of the possibilities, but r recalling that the palettes are chosen not to distort the data. So the, 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 to give a reasonable view of the data given a choice of class intervals. Now, if you choose some really weird class intervals, then you're going to get some fairly odd uh, data. With categorical data, then maybe, again, bets may be off, and there will be other reasons for that, too. At the moment, we're just talking about class intervals. And we'll get to other things uh, later on. So... Uh, the plot method takes a class interval object and a palette. If the palette is too short, it will be interpolated. So the, 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 the missing colors will be interpolated in, 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 in the palette. Uh, and here we can see that, the, uh, that the, um, the data themselves, this is an empirical cumulative distribution function uh, of the variable, and that that it's it's fairly obvious that the deprivation score takes a, a a minimum value of zero. This is for a census tract, in fact, where there were few inhabitants and view of the seas. Was, okay, and uh, it goes up to uh, uh, over uh, over 0 0.9. Uh, with this data set, there are 243 values. We can't see natural breaks. Uh, and the term used in ArcGIS and elsewhere in QGIS is natural breaks, was the idea being that you can more or less see, as if, if one was pushed, one might say, okay, this looks like a natural break, or this looks like a natural break. But actually, it, not necessarily, not necessarily. But it, it has been trying to move observations across the boundary and see whether the uh, ratio of within group and between group variance has got worse so it's trying to do a good job at doing that but obviously if you've got more than uh, some thousands of observations it's going to take some time to to to, to do it so this is this is uh, the, this is the display of all the uh, color bra palettes which we've we've seen however uh, colors have been getting much more, uh, much more um, in focus uh, in in the R project over the the past few years. Among other things, the color space package. This is this is this is also going back quite a long way. Uh, one of the two uh, people who wrote R is Rossi Haka, uh, as a statistician. In addition to working on on uh, on uh, statistical computing at a very low level, so in considerable uh, sophistication. He's also been very interested in visualization. And Paul Murrell uh, is one of his collaborators still in Auckland, and, and Hadley Wickham is another collaborator who's now in, in, in the States. Um, and he was very concerned by the way in which we represent colors because the, the color space, the one we use, the easiest one to use is RGB because that's the one that sort of comes out of digital cameras and, and many uh, devices, displays, beamers, they're expecting RGB. It's just that RGB works very well for computers, but it doesn't work very well for human perception. 
because, uh, for instance, in, in the rainbow palettes, then, then the light yellow or the light magenta are not very strong colours, but some of the other colours are very strong. So those are the ones you see, and the other ones, which may take an intermediate value, so you see two strong things and one weak thing, and the weak thing appears to shift in its value towards zero. <laughs> so you sort of think they must be less important things there. Whereas, in fact, it's simply a matter of the way in which the, the colour space is, is defined. So that uh, using, uh, using the colour space, color space package and parts of that package which have been moved into the GR devices package, which is a central part of our um, uh, HCL palettes, uh, do, do, do very well. So that if we want, say, to, to display some of the HCL palettes, then these are sequential single-hued palettes with uh, n equals 7. So that we can choose other palettes uh, from... From, from the color space package. And in addition uh, to this, the, um, uh, the, uh, the HCL wizard um, function in the color space package is quite nice. Um, so, where should we, maybe we can, we, we could, we could uh, slip out to, Uh, HCL Wizard is a uh, uh, a website uh, for sort of R and other people because the the much of the uh, much of the research has been done using R, and it's then the the attempt is then to propagate it to 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 other uh, other other users. Um, uh, if you enjoy uh, a, a good uh, paper, then either the end of the rainbow or somewhere over the rainbow are uh, phenomenal. They're they, when they demonstrate specifically why human perception doesn't work with the rainbow palette, and they they even have the uh, uh, a Twitter hashtag end rainbow, sort of campaign for ending the rainbow palette. So that if they see a display on Twitter which is using the rainbow palette, then one of them will read, is, will either add a comment with the hashtag or, or, or uh, 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 retweet with a comment saying, someone else who could do with a little brushing up their colors. <laughs> uh, the, the specific problem with, with, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, with the rainbow is that, is that the human, human uh, uh, cognitive perception just doesn't work like the rainbow palette. So that the rainbow palette runs from uh, one end of RGB to the other end of RGB. And it, and it, it just doesn't work for people. Uh, but there are, there are, there are, there's lots of information here and it's also possible to, uh, to go out to as a, there's a palette creator here, which is a um, this is is running on a server in Innsbruck, if I remember correctly, and is is a shiny app. So it's a shiny app running on a on a server in Innsbruck, and it's then possible to uh, to modify some of the some of the settings and. So you can mess things up really. So you can make everything look really, really messy. It's, it, it provides probably too many, uh, too many um, alternatives. We could go to um, basic qual qualitative. It's some of some some of the palettes look really like sweet shops. And so the, the the but the the key thing that they're focusing on is that none of the intensities of the so none of the colors are much more in your face than the others. So it gives you a chance as a, as a, as a reader of the graphic to read off the values. And that's, that's the, 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 the underlying. Uh, you can also uh, apply um, color blindness. This is Deuton color blindness or Proton color blindness. It would take a little while to refresh. Or Triton color blindness. So this would be with that a 
someone with trait and colour blindness would see this display like that. So the 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 the, the site is is quite good for giving you a feel for uh, for how this works. Um, this is a, a further aside, but I won't take you to the site because uh, everyone here can see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's also a strand in work by Paul Murrell uh, with collaborators on representing data graphics for uh, uh, sight impaired people. That's not colorblind because colorblind people receive a signal. It's just that the signal is, is not the same signal that non-colorblind people receive. But for people who receive an attenuated visual signal, uh, how, how can they handle this? And he has, has a, a, a whole hour's talk in the Ihaka lecture series last year um, on finding English words, expressing colors, such that people who've never seen colors understand them. And it, it's fasc fascinating stuff. You, you, don't, uh, you don't really need to go there unless you're working with sight-impaired people, but, but it is done. So that there's an R package which shows you how to do that, and obviously then you just connect it to the uh, text-to-speech uh, uh, adapter, and it will generate the speech. Uh, I've chaired a session with a blind graphics person where the graphics display is decomposed into its graphics elements and read out at about uh, 200 words a minute so that nobody else could understand what the picture was, but the, the blind person could understand it because he was used to listening to very high frequency speech, not, not high in terms of pitch, pitch, uh, but it, the, the, the words were coming really fast. So it would be uh, 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 vertical line left side, uh, axes values are from this, that, and that. And, 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 and there was, again, uh, uh, R functions under the hood pulling out the descriptions of what was going on so that this person could comprehend this. With maps, this is quite difficult to do. Uh, tactile maps are probably better, uh, so that you've got a, a, a tactile surface which is pushing up pins, so that the, that you can use you, you, you use your fingers to, to to detect them. Anyway, the, the, there's really quite a lot of action on on colours, uh, including uh, a recent uh, R blog, which again I'd, I'd uh, direct your attention to that. Uh, blog, has it come up, or this one? A new palette for R, published uh, 10 days ago, and it was updated today. Um, and there's been some feedback. This is, this is going to be the default palette from R4. And the palette is, this is, this is the current default palette, which is quite close in its understanding of colors to, uh, to um, uh, the dreaded rainbow. And this is the, this is the new one. So the colors are actually quite similar, but they're much more balanced. And the change which was made was to, the change which was made this morning was uh, between magenta and yellow and so that there've been so, and Jakob Novosad has been very active on this so he's, he's he's been working on this so it, it it isn't it isn't completed yet but but that they're working working on on defining a, a, a new palette which will be uh, in terms of use of colors will be responsible uh, so that the names of the colors will remain the same so that it will get if you ask for red in R36, you get this. If you ask for red in R4, which is what we hope will be coming in March, April, this is the color which you'll get. So it will, it will differ um, in the way that it's e e expressed. And 
then then there are there are there are a, a, a series of other remarks demonstrating the palette images. This is the current palette. This is the new palette, and then then they've they, they've attempted to to check from each way uh, how how thing how things how things work. Um, these are the distinctions which you'd make under Deuteran anomaly. The old palette, new palette. The new palette probably should work better. That it's it's easier to distinguish between these two than between these two, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, if if you were in prot, uh, proton anomaly, prot, prot anomaly, then you're in in this setting and so on. So that. It should also be possible to uh, to set a number of other palettes. The uh, Okabe uh, Ito uh, is also a, a mostly categorical. Um, so this 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 palette here, and a number of others. So that there are there are a whole set of of different things. This is the universal color design uh, Okabe Ito. Uh, set of, of of and their their principles for for universal color and then they're describing the human visual system and and its imp impairments and how particular kinds of impairments can affect uh, affect so that the this 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 would then be in so rainbow territory this is how non color blind see it this would be uh, uh, protanope see it this would be deuteran uh, deuteranope see it this way and try and you can see that there are differences and we're dealing with some some percentage of of the population with with these uh, with these um, uh, challenges possibly possibly um, can possibly also suggest uh, this Link, which is to another web book. This is a web book of uh, uh, which, which also has a published version by O'Reilly, uh, and many of the considerations here are, are particularly well chosen. So that that for 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 our purposes, we interacted certainly Edsa Pepsmer interacted a good deal with Klaus uh, in uh, in handling in in handling. Um, uh, geospatial data. So there's there's a, a good deal of uh, of work done here uh, to uh, to describe geospatial data and its particular its particular attractions and challenges. One of the things which is mentioned is that visually, say a polygon like. Let's choose one one of these. A polygon like this, there's quite a lot of ink, so that the the relative area, depending a little bit on whether it's geographical coordinates or projected coordinates, the relative areas of the of the um, of the units or entities that one's using for uh, for choropleth mapping, this thematic mapping using polygons. Some of them will be very visible. And others, which may, in terms of the data, be more interesting, possibly, say, because they've got a, a larger number of the population at risk, if we're looking at epidemiology, that then so that Rhode Island isn't, isn't terribly visible. Uh, whereas some, well, California is important and will be visible because it's big too. Uh, but how you handle the other things is is and the, the, there's there's a good deal of discussion also on Twitter on on Stack Overflow and and other places about about how to handle that. A standard uh, um, a standard adaptation is to use uh, what are known as cartograms, where you are, where you say if you're dealing with the numbers of votes cast in an election, you would weight the area of the unit of interest by its contribution to the final vote. So that if the number of votes cast in a 
an aerially large state is small, then that state will be, will be shrunken. However, it's extremely difficult for those who are not used to using cartograms to find out where they are on the map. Uh, one intermediate step, which is now being used quite a lot in the media before the uh, UK general election, is to use a hexagon in place of the polygon, which means that because most parliamentary constituencies have, and there's, there's a band of numbers of voters, so that some do have twice as many voters as others, but they're, they're in the same ballpark. So that you use a hexagon for each of the constituencies, and then you can see which one is first past the post, and it, it flips to a particular color, categorical color, depending on whether it's first past the post. But in other situations where you're dealing with uh, socioeconomic variables or health variables, there's no obvious reason for using hexagons because there's no, there's no reason why the, the entities should be uh, uh, the same population size or the same number of population at risk or things, 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 of, things of this kind. So you've got a link there to, to Klaus uh, Wilkie's uh, interesting book, so that uh, data visualization, this is, this is a, a fairly um, well thought through book. The code is also there, so it's possible to see the code and, and explore the, uh, the solutions which are provided. So, on to thematic mapping. Now, one of the steps which was taken by Edsa Pepsma, which we hadn't done in SP, because ClassInt didn't exist before SP. ClassInt was written in 2007 and SP was two years before. So that the plot methods and the SP plot method in the SP package do not use class int. We could simply go straight in and not use class int itself uh, in this plot method for the deprivation variable in SF. So this is a plot method for uh, an SF polygon uh, uh, geometry where we're filling the polygons with the values of this variable where the breaks are defined by the breaks found in the class int object which we've already defined and the palette is as before. So we could do it that way. That's fine. That has the advantage if we're using multiple displays that we have control that the same breaks are going to be used each time through. So that even if you're looking at, um, as I was going to say, even if you're looking at different data, you're using the same breaks. Sometimes you may wish to do that. <coughs> and that makes it possible to do so. You can stabilize them, or you can just give a vector of values that these are the breaks you want to use. Uh, this is a, a basic graphics method so that what's returned by the plot method are the settings of the graphics, uh, graphics device parameters, the PAR. The SF plot methods <coughs> also feed through to class int so that if you say the number of breaks is seven and breaks is is Fisher, then it feeds that through to class int, says style is Fisher, off you go, and give me the breaks. So it would take the number of breaks and the breaks variable. If it's character, then it will pass it through to class int. If breaks itself is a vector of numbers, which it was <coughs> here, it will use those directly. But it can hand off to, uh, to class int to... to um, to, to, to grab the, and the displays are exactly the same. There are two places, or two, two, two here with, with zero values. It's also possible to plot using just SFC, so that if you say plot of ST underscore geometry of the SF object, it would just plot the points, lines, polygons, without any variable. If you say, on the other hand, 
uh, just plot of the SF object. It will try to plot all of the uh, columns. So it would take each of the columns separately and make a separate map so that they think you get uh, nine or ten as a maximum, which can be a bit surprising. So that you need to subset by column. Uh, the TMAP package, uh, both uh, Tenek is 2018. This is another uh, example of my being a, a proactive editor. So I gave Martin a fairly hard time in review. So as he's handling editor in the Journal of Statistical Software. Uh, and the reviewers, so I'd chosen reviewers who would push back and say, raise your game, go on. You can do it, make it better. So he did. <laughs> And he's continued to, to, to keep the package moving very nicely. Uh, chapter 8 of uh, the um, Geocomp, that's a Geocomputation with R, the book which I recommended yesterday. So that's... Um, um, no, that wasn't very successful. We're still on the same. We're still on the same page, uh, but I haven't moved off it, so I need to. Maybe I didn't even open the page. Uh, no, I don't think it even opened the page. Uh, the uh, the journal of statistical so okay so it just took me to the references which is what it was supposed to do okay so so it takes me to the references and here I can open the the link uh, now the the link has opened the geocomputation is uh, is uh, uh, again. Uh, involved in advising the authors and and uh, pushing them in the direction of choosing SF, but it was their, their decision to write uh, chapter eight on uh, using uh, using uh, TMAP, uh, and their introduction is much more comprehensive than what I'm going to say. So, uh, team, the probably the best tool for learning TMAP at the moment is. Uh, is uh, as uh, as as you uh, as you see it. Um, I don't think there's there's anything. No. Um, one of the other things that they've done, if 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 you're involved in teaching spatial stuff as well, then you'll probably also find other chapters useful because they, they give a, 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 a good introduction. But they also, or Jakob Novos had decided that it would be a good idea for the purpose of writing the book to assemble a package which just has uh, spatial data. So there's spatial data and spatial data large. And spatial data large is uh, hosted off CRAN because it contains uh, data files which are larger, but, but data files which are larger than CRAN permits, but uh, which they needed for the book. And if you install uh, SP data and uh, uh, load and attach it, then you get a message up telling you how to, how to install uh, SP data large. So that here there are the, they're starting off with TMAP and Leaflet and MapView and ggplot and, and so on, and um, carry on like that. So they also have a number of, uh, a number of uh, um, timely warnings, like one from Cynthia Brewer, amateur-looking maps can undermine your audience's ability to understand important information and weaken the presentation of a professional data investigation and so on. So, so they, 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 they do the scary stuff fairly early on in the chapter. Uh, what TMAP does is create a, uh, what I've termed a coherent uh, plotting system, which is modern. 
Uh, the modern approach to plotting began with uh, uh, Auckland, Paul Murrell, the grid package. The grid package was outside core R for quite a long time, but has then is now, well, for, for many years has been part of core R. What the, um, none of you have seen, a, have any of you ever seen a pen plotter? You even know what a, you, you you know what a pen plotter is. Anybody else know what a pen plotter is? So a pen plotter was a device which your computer managed. You could connect it to a PC, which had it might have eight pens of different colours, and the computer would send an instruction first: go to pen green, very much like the base the base R the standard R palette. So go and pick up the green pen move to X something, Y something, put the pen down on the paper, draw to delta X, delta Y, pick the pen up, move the pen back to the rack, pick up the red pen, move to, and that's how base R graphics worked for a very, very long time. So that the base R graphics is that the screen or the graphics device is like the paper on a pen plotter, and you're picking up a colour and drawing on it. Uh, Paul Murrell made two innovations about 10 years ago. One was to permit you to display an image without drawing each pixel in the way that a pen plotter did. Pen plotters draw, drew images by drawing, poly, drawing squares or rectangles and filling them with colour. And that was what base R graphics did until he said, this is this is this is too old fashioned, and so now now it can do images. So it does a, a raster image properly. It just dumps the image onto the graphics display. Uh, and he's also handled the hole in hole in polygon problem, uh, because not just maps have problems with holes in polygons. But if you're doing a complicated display and you want to be able to see through a hole in an in a in an otherwise three dimensional object then you need to handle the hole in object so that he handles the hole in object uh, drawing problem for arbitrary polygons, not just for, 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 for maps. But he started to get frustrated by the fact that once you'd committed the ink, it was just there. <laughs> so the base graphics, once the ink's committed, there's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you can draw over it with, with background color if background color is white. So you can you can you can't rub it out. It's there, but you have to paint on top of it if you want to if you want to do something else. So he said that this is clunky, but if say we have a virtual graphic device in uh, in memory, that's the the grid device, then we can put stuff on that and we can update it. So we can say no, we didn't want that line or. Uh, we didn't want the axes configured in that way, or we wanted to do this, we wanted to do that. This led to the uh, writing of the lattice package for trellis graphics, which is mostly for conditioned graphics, particularly when you're displaying uh, two things. Say, say that you're displaying the, the uh, distribution of uh, morbidity for men and women, and you want to display them as, as a pair of maps. So that was the kind of thing. That's what's in S S uh, SP plot using Lattice. Now, uh, Depayan Sarkan, in addition to Lattice, wrote Lattice Extra, and in Lattice Extra, he introduced the plus notation. And the plus notation was to allow you to update a grid object, or actually the usually term grobs, so a graphics object. And that a graphics object, a grob, is what grid handles so that and th there are packages for converting base graphics to grobs so that you can edit them together and tmap uses grobs so that what tmap does is to follow the grid graphics uh, paradigm very consistently using the plus to update the existing the uh, existing object uh, so that what we get here is uh, what we're doing is first is setting the tmap mode to uh, plot. And tmap also uses class int internally. 
So what we're saying is that these are the boundaries we want to use, and we want to fill them with the variable which is called depriv, so the deprivation, using stylefish and n uh, is seven, and the palette are reds, and we're now using a string reds because it's referring directly to, to uh, our color brewer, and can also refer to other sources of, of uh, palettes which are suitable for, for, for cartography. Okay, so what happens? We put this into O. Where's the picture? No picture. What have we got? We've got a TMAP object. How do we display it? We print it. So that we just, if we just type O, then the current state of the graphics object will be displayed. And here we get this. Uh, like this one, you get a, a, a default legend. The one in, in uh, uh, SF puts a vertical legend down the side with, with, a, with a scale on, on the side, which is a bit like the way Lattice did it. Uh, the way uh, TMAP does it is by uh, rounding the values to a certain extent and displaying them in this way, but you can change the way that that's displayed. Uh, in general, the level of complexity in TMAP for customizing the display that you're producing is, is probably an order of magnitude less than ggplot, but it's the same kind of thing, that, that you can adjust the aesthetics, but they're not called necessarily aesthetics. They'll be called layouts for the particular map element that one's concerned with. Uh, since the, the, the objects are grobs, so graphics objects, they can be updated, as in lattice with lattice extra or ggplot2, so that if you say O plus, and then we want uh, alpha at half and line width at half a standard unit, uh, we can add the census track boundaries to, to the display. We don't have to regenerate the graphics object which contains the, the, uh, the um, choropleth map. We just update, update the object and, and display, display that. Uh, TMAP, uh, during the process of writing the uh, Journal of Statistical Software uh, paper, uh, TMAP was split into TMAP and TMAP tools. TMAP tools is always available when, when, uh, when TMAP is present. And Palette Explorer lets one explore the palettes which are, which are immediately available through, uh, through TMAP. And they change over time as, as it's extended and will almost certainly also change after the change uh, between R3.6 and, and R4. Uh, the cartography package there are a couple of uh, articles um, by uh, uh, Timothy Giraud and, and I forget the name, the first name of Lambert. Um, they have a GitHub site. They have a cheat sheet. Uh, people have pointed out recently that cheat sheet is not necessarily the the best description because you're not cheating. You're you're simply looking at a, a summary of the information about the package. And uh, it's also now associated with ROSM. Uh, that's one of the reasons why they were doing it, because they, they needed things to, 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 to work there. And they can, they can, they can use a number of, of different uh, tiled map sources for displaying behind, behind the data. Um, it's also possible to hill shade and do various things like that, so that there are, there are, an, there are a number of additional features which can be used uh, in, in the cartography package. These are the, uh, the, the palettes which it itself provides. Um, um, the, these are mostly uh, sequential, um, sort of si single hue sequential of, of various kinds, but with, with particular choices. Uh, and with with um, a pastel and multi multi valued uh, multi valued um, uh, categorical uh, variables, qualitative variables. Now, what is possibly not the choice I would have made if I was making it is that uh, uh, the 
cartography package uses base graphics, which has the advantage that you can overplot, it's easy to overplot, but you have to do extra work if you want to get it out into a grid so that so you can create a nice graphic, but it's being delivered on the device you're on. Uh, and and so, so say, say that you were using TeamUp and you say, okay, I want it as a PDF. And that's going into my published article. And for the HTML version, I want it as a PNG. Now, if you've got your object, you just print, open a device, print to that device, close the device, open a different device, print to that device, close. The... With uh, the SF plot methods and the functions in the cartography package, you don't have that opportunity. You've got to repeat all of the instructions in order to get it out. There is a way to use device copy, but it's it's clunkier than than using grid as the underlying uh, uh, repository for for the for the graphical product. Uh, the cartography package also uses uh, class int internally, so it would call it method Fisher Jenks. So it use, uses its own terms before passing off to Fisher, and works in more or less the same same kind of way. If we want to round the the legend uh, values, then we have to tell it how to do it. It, it. it can choose in different ways. Here, unfortunately, it dropped the trailing zero, um, and we don't get 0, 0.000 for, for the break at the bottom. Um, it takes control of the graphics device in the same way that the plot methods for SF take control of the graphics device. So that say you were using the graphics device here in SF, and you say, ah, but I'd like to put a star on one of the census tracts. Now, how do you do that? You don't. Or you can do it, but it, it's really quite hard to get it in register because uh, the SF plus plot method, when it has a legend, has taken control of the plot window and rescaled the bit you're going to draw the map in to leave place for the legend. So it's divided into two, so you've got a place for the legend and a place for the map. And once it's left that, the graphics device reverts to its normal geometry. So that if you want to drop something down onto the centroid of one of, the, say, if we wanted to, to draw a star in the middle of this one, it would be extremely hard to put the star there. If you're in team up, this is really easy. You just, you just say another TM shape for the dot, star, go, off you go, done. Uh, if you're in Coropleth, what you find is that you're looking up extra functions to help you do it. So the extra functions will help you do it, and it can be done. And for people who use Cor the the the, the uh, approach to to uh, Coropleth mapping or uh, professional cartography in the Coropleth in the cartography package, find it uh, very uh, very um, attractive. So it does work, and you make really nice really nice maps. Uh, but it you need you need to have made that choice uh, with team up you can use team up you don't feel that you've had to make a choice it, it feels uh, uh, slightly slightly more natural perhaps for for this reason the the uh, the plotting functions in in cartography return null so they don't even return the settings of the graphics device uh, in much of uh, the uh, ggplot2 package has been uh, seen as a uh, preferred way of uh, generating um, uh, statistical graphics. In some settings, this is not unreasonable. I have here run into a character set problem, which I wasn't aware of. Uh, I thought that this, these were going to display as decimal degrees, but they've, they, they've been subverted on their way out to GitHub, I, I believe. So they should have displayed uh, degrees.
Now, when you choose to use this approach with SP, you were stuck because the object you were going to pass through as the data was not a data frame. Uh, so that the preferred route that uh, that uh, ggplot users had was to use fortify, so that they would fortify the SP object, which meant spread out all of the coordinates in a data frame where you repeated the values of the... so that for all of the perhaps 150, 200,000 coordinates uh, which are involved in the boundaries of these uh, census tracts, you would get a data frame of some 200,000 rows where the deprivation values would be repeated for, for all of the uh, points on the boundary of a given census tract. They would repeat all of the values of the attributes. Just, just yeah. There, there aren't significant problems here with holes in polygons. When uh, SF was published, uh, a geom SF was provided, and the geom SF then takes the uh, uh, aesthetic of a fill of the depriv variable. And as in non standard evaluation, this is not in quotation marks, whereas you would have seen that everywhere, so here it's in quotation marks. Here, it's in quotation marks in the plot method from SF. It's in quotation marks. Standard evaluation, quotation marks. It's the name of a variable uh, in, in the data frame. In ggplot, it isn't. Um, and if you just run straight in, what you get is, uh, is, is this. I attempted to persuade Hadley that the general policy of ggplot for the default theme that you have to provide a graticule is not a good idea for geographical data. In this case, the graticule is in addition provided in geographical coordinates, whereas the data themselves are in UTM 25. So, so why any observer would need to have the numbers of degrees west of the city centre is beyond me. I just don't get it. So I think that this qualifies unequivocally as a, a, a poor uh, data-to-ink ratio. I don't think, it, don't think it's necessary. If you want contextualization, then you might go for a background map, and there was a package called ggmaps, which ran for quite a long time, where you downloaded uh, a tile from, uh, from Google Maps and placed it behind uh, the data display. We have a problem there with the number of lookups that it's possible to do on the Google API, the Google Maps API, which is very limited. Um, so that if you're if you know ahead of time that you want to grab a particular uh, background tile to put in as the background, you can do that. Uh, most users, since Leaflet and MapView have appeared, just don't don't do that. The, 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 that's something which so it's pre-Leaflet, post-Leaflet. So after, once Leaflet's available, then then you just don't 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 do that. But providing contextual information, yes. But in maps, very often, contextual information will be given in part, depending on what you're displaying, in part it will be given just by the shape. Is that the viewer looking at the framework map of the US states in Klaus Wickler's book, they recognize it. They, they knew, know where California is in relation to New York. As you don't even need to put place names on it. In some situations, you may need to put place names on a map to give sufficient contextual support for the viewer. Uh, if there are particular um, field plots which have names in the text, then they may need to be named on the map. 
but it needs to be thought through and providing a, a graticule in geographical coordinates uh, it should never have been a priority. It is possible to get rid of it, so we can do that by saying theme void, but maybe there would have been other things in the theme we wish to retain, which are now taken out because we've globally removed, we've said theme void for everything, so that's all we get now is this. If we want to change to the red palette, we can do that, but we also then have to back out of the uh, design decision in ggplot, if not in the geom sf, uh, which is to go from dark means little and light means much. So we can back out of that. So we can change the palette. We can say we want the scale fill distiller. Palette is red, going to color brewer. And we can say direction is one rather than the other way. So we're going f light is little deprivation, dark is much deprivation. So we can go to the way in which all of the other uh, cartographic uh, functions and methods have handled this, uh, uh, as we've as we've seen as, as we've seen before. To get more control, uh, you end up with a with a construction which is typically twice as long as Tmap. So the number of things you have to fix is about twice as long as Tmap. Here I haven't fixed the continuous scale and I would really like to insert the scale as the class intervals. And doing that is possible, but you have, again, you have to impose it. Is say, is get, me back to, get me back to really what... All I wanted to begin with was a map like I could get from cartography or Tmap. Just give, give, give me a simple map. And the simple map is class intervals which are discrete, not continuous. Little is light. Much is dark. We don't need a graticule. Do we need a, a north arrow and a scale? Maybe. It depends on the context. If we have a contextual background, then we probably don't need a scale, and we probably don't need a north arrow, unless vertical is not north. If vertical is not north, then a north arrow is desirable. In quite a lot of, of, of uh, choropleth mapping, you don't really need a, a kilometer scale because probably the units of observation have been described in some detail, and the user has, or the viewer has some idea as to whether this is about a kilometer, about 100 meters, or about 10 kilometers. As they, they have a, an innate understanding of the scale, and what they're actually trying to look at is not how far things are from each other, but are there clusters of high values or low values of the variable of interest. However, there can be situations in which uh, in inserting a scale or a north arrow is uh, advantageous, and that can, that can be done, and it can be done in all of the uh, preceding, uh, preceding methods. With ggplot, I'm, I'm pretty certain that it can, also, it can also be done. Okay. If we then change the TMAP mode to view, we can display the same map, uh, but on a leaflet background. The choice of layers is slightly different. At the moment, we're looking at the Esri World Grey Canvas. Um, we could then go to the World Topo Map, which looks like this or we could go to OpenStreetMap. Those are the three which are available at the moment in, 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 in TMAP. Uh, you'll see that compared to, to other variants, the, the way that it tries to handle the boundaries is such that at a certain zoom level, you get, uh, you'll get slivers between the boundaries. So you, so you can try and zoom in here. And when we zoom in, then the slivers sort of get smaller 
So I'm not quite sure what, what's going on there, but I think that TMAP is in view mode, is trying to reduce the, or generalize the lines, which may lead to slivers appearing. So that if I zoom out, then you should be able to see the sliver coming back. There's, there's a little sliver here, sort of in a gap between these two. If I go out again, then more slivers will appear. So I think it's trying to do that on, on the fly, which, to be honest, it, it doesn't, doesn't need to do because it, it's visually, uh, visually uh, <coughs> a, little, uh, a little distracting. Um, the human cognitive system, again, looks for, for, uh, for, for anomalies. <coughs> and the lit small white lines around the boundaries, they attract your attention. So you look at those rather than at the data. One thing which which is important with TMAP's view mode is that the the alpha channel or the alpha values of the uh, of the legend are the same as those in the map. Whereas if we then go down to to map view, you can see that all of these are a little paler than the legend. These are shown in full, and these are slightly reduced alpha channel. So that when you're trying to do a visual tabular lookup, so you say, OK, so I've got this value here. Of course, we could cheat. We could say, OK, this has a deprivation value of 0 0.23, so it must be in in this class. But actually, this looks quite pale. So this, this one here is 0.239. We've got one here, which is 1. Um, is 0.168. Let me find one. It, it's the ones along the coast, which are the, have the, the lowest deprivation, possibly for obvious reasons the ones with the sea view, so that they, they have low level. Whereas the, the ones up in the valleys here uh, are, are much, much higher. Uh, the backstory to the, to the, um, to the Alinda uh, leprosy map was, was quite interesting, so I'll, I'll just mention it briefly. The conundrum which uh, public health people had found was that uh, they found a U-shaped correlation between the incidence of registration of leprosy cases and deprivation. They found this counterintuitive because they expected it to be linear or close to linear in deprivation. So the more deprived an area, the more likely it would be that, uh, that uh, new cases of leprosy would be reported. But they managed to dig down into what was actually going on on the ground. And what was going on on the ground were that there were leprosy cases, but they were from people who, because of their resident status, that they weren't registered residents of the addresses. It meant that they didn't have access to health facilities. So that they were ill, but they had nowhere to register their illness. And when they changed the health policy to say that even if you're an unregistered resident, but you're feeling really ill and, and your relatives say that maybe, maybe you should go to the leprosy clinic, you go to the leprosy clinic and you get registered irrespective of whether you're a registered resident or not and your illness will be treated, irrespective of, as to whether you are a legal resident or a non-legal resident. And then the, the relationship sort of snapped into place so that, so that the, the people who previously had been uh, unwilling or uh, felt that they were unable to get help for their condition were suddenly able to get their, their condition. Uh, what's the connection between Bergen and leprosy? Why? The guy, yeah, Armour Hansen. Uh, Armour Hansen got struck off as a doctor. There, there were, uh, he felt this was at the stage where microscopes were getting almost good enough to see uh, 
sort of bacteria-sized things. But from looking at the symptoms of two of his patients, he saw that the symptoms were completely different. So he infected one of the patients from the second one to see if the symptoms got picked up, and they did. <laughs> this wasn't a, a 21st century medical experiment, and it got him struck off because the unfortunate patient was already dying, and they died a bit quicker. He, he had asked, is he okay? And, but but there, were no, there was no paper trail. There was no ethical committee or anything like that, so he got struck off. Uh, but Bergen was the city where the actual causal mechanisms for leprosy were, were first identified. Bergen was a city with a lot of leprosy. Uh, in in the in the nineteenth century, partly partly because of a very restricted diet and partly because of poverty, West Western Norway was a very poor part of the world. So, so, uh, so, uh, so when when Marilia came to me with the data set, says you work in Bergen, that's just the right place. So we we go with that. So so we did that. Okay, so map, map view gives us uh, a picture like this. We can exert control over the, the um, thickness of lines and things like that. However, we, we can't use class int directly. We have to pass through the breaks in the at uh, here. And then we, we, we're using the same breaks. We're using the pal before. But the, the alpha level in the display itself is suppressed so that they're not... So you've got a chance maybe to pick up some of the features uh, from from behind the the map. Uh, there's no playing around with the uh, with the borders, so that you don't get slivers appearing uh, behind the borders. Uh, and. If we went, say, to uh, if we go to this one, world imagery, uh, at this close, it's a bit difficult to associate things with things because you can't even really see the borders of the of the census tracts, so that the, you're too close to see them. Uh, but if you can depend on what we were doing this morning, the coordinate reference systems, and you're working with field data, the ability to pull up a web map and to uh, explore your data in the context of a uh, web map background, uh, most people have found that this is extremely, extremely useful. Uh, of course, you can pull up the, the full sort of list of, of, of what's going on here. The, 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 these were the number of cases. This was the population, uh, population at risk, deprivation. Here were the, the, the number of cases, zero, uh, the number of cases here were six, the number of cases here were three, and so on. One, one case there. Um, we didn't have access to this when we were looking at the data set originally. This, 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 it, wasn't, it simply wasn't, uh, wasn't uh, feasible. couple of examples of, uh, of uh, conditioned plots. So this is a plot from the Polish presidential election. The data are in the, in the SP data large package. And so the, these are uh, all, uh, two and a half thousand uh, local authorities and borough, boroughs in, in Warsaw, the capital. There were two uh, uh, Two candidates went through to the second round. Obviously, it's, it's the two two first ones. These were their voting shares in the in the first round, um, with a clear ge geographical picture that the the voting share in in some of the eastern districts and particularly the rural or small town eastern districts was much higher for the uh, right wing candidate and the centrist candidate was much more towards the north and west and in urban areas such as in, in the capital Warsaw. So that here we're, we're saying, okay, so we've got one set of polygons. We're saying the facets with free scales are false, that we want to use the same scale 
for both. We don't want them to be one scale for one candidate and a different scale for the other. We want the legend to apply to both of the displays. These are the borders we want to put in, and we're going to say that the, the, um, the, the TM layout, the panel labels are going to be for the left one, Duda, the right one, Komarovsky. Otherwise, you'd get the, the values from, from, from the variables here. These are the ones we're going to fill with, two of them. Uh, it's what, uh, what's referred to as a small multiple. You wouldn't want to display 15 because it would be impossible to, to read the legend. But in this case, even though uh, I said initially that we can perceive nine things, actually, we can do better than that, looking, sort of contrasting these two displays, then anyone looking at the displays would get the message that uh, if you're in the south and east, you're much more likely to vote for one of the candidates and in the north and west for the other candidates. And in addition here, we're displaying the, the, um, uh, the intensity of voting so that in some of these local authorities in the, in the, in, 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 in the east, almost nobody votes for anybody else than the right-wing candidate. And the, at that, in 2015, in the first round, there were uh, there were quite a number of right of right wing candidates, but this was the one from from the the this was the one that who won won the election. But you can see some of the areas here are really quite dark colours, so that dominance in those local authorities was much larger than in the case of the centrist uh, candidate, who was the defending um, uh, president who was running for a second term. So what we're doing here is we're addressing whether we want to use the same legend or different legends here. We're setting the panel labels here. We're saying these are the two variables we want to, uh, we want to contrast. We're using six um, breaks, pretty. How many did we get? We got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So we got more breaks than we asked for, but there wasn't a pretty way of dividing it up. So that we, here we got it divided up by one tenth for each of each of the steps, and we could enter the title here: first round share of votes. If we then go for the second round share of votes, do you remember what I was saying about a T map? It uses grid graphics. So here, here we've got a template for the map we want to draw, and here we're filling it in this time for the first round, where there were other candidates present, and then for the second round. What we could have done, maybe, was to define the breaks over both the first and the second round so that the legend would be the same. The legend's not the same here. You can see that it's split. It's also pretty. We also asked for six, but here we got steps not by 0.1, but by 0.2. Visually, the maps are pretty similar. Um, possibly, it's it's somewhat surprising that that the, there are areas here which are in the lowest class for the centrist candidate, which means that less than twenty percent voted for that option, and everybody else, there's more than eighty percent voted for the for for the right wing candidate. And again, you can pick out the regularities with the the south and east and rural areas uh, voting. Uh, uh, voting against the centrist candidate and for the right-wing candidate and areas to the north and west voting for the centrist candidate and against the right-wing candidate. There's been work done by uh, Oscar Perpign uh, uh, Perpignan. There's a book, second edition has come out on, on uh, uh, displaying spatial and spatial temporal data. He himself works in the solar panel industry and was first interested in finding ways of displaying insulation as, uh, as, as a variable. Um, and in some blogs and in, in the book, he approaches trying to display a third variable at the same time. These are voting data, so there's no uncertainty, there's no estimation involved. But uncertainty could be a, a, a different dimension which we also wish to, to display in the same context. 
Some people have suggested using the alpha channel to handle uncertainty, so that if you're less certain, you should sort of make the, the intensity less intense by, by backing off the alpha channel, maybe. In the case of voting data, it might be quite useful to know what the turnout was. So that if you, if you attempted to weight these displays by the turnout, so here we've got the percentage of those votes which were valid cast votes. But we don't know, for instance, whether people in this kind part of the country, even though relatively many of them voted for the centrist candidate, maybe there were simply fewer of them who turned out. And because this is a presidential election, you're counting the votes over the whole country, so that if turnout was higher in areas which favoured one candidate and lower in areas which otherwise favoured a different candidate, this was obviously going to uh, affect the, the result strongly. And this is the same kind of thing that you see in... in the, 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 this is uh, uh, first past the post because it's a presidential election, but you also see some of these things happening, happening in, in proportional electoral systems, so that turnout has a, a differential effect. Uh, if you're interested in uh, um, scary map stories, uh, or even if you aren't interested in them, I can certainly recommend a uh, recent uh, book by uh, Let's see if it picks up the book first. Uh, um, uh, Alberto Cairo is a... Um, here we are. This is, sorry, this is the Amazon uh, page, but it's, it's found the right book. Uh, a very nice new book, You're looking for a Christmas present. This is the one, one of the ones. Apart, once, once you've got Geocompar, that's, that's the, the Loveless Novosad uh, Munchau book, then, then go for this one. It, he... Uh, he also has an Ihaka lecture, uh, an excellent Ihaka lecture from 2018. Um, really nice. Spends, well, if you really like President Trump, then perhaps Alberto Cairo is not the person to go for because he explains not only why there are problems with hurricanes, which is in a subsequent blog, but, but he, he explains why Republicans like showing the map of counties with a majority Trump vote, which shows most of America painted red. But if you population weight them, the reds sort of turn very pale. <laughs> They're counties which are large in area, but with a very small voting population. And the counties with large voting populations are much more likely to be Democrat. And so that in the end, uh, Cairo, in, in the, in, in presumably also in the book, but in, in the Ahaka lecture series, uh, says, well, perhaps we shouldn't use maps for displaying election data. Perhaps we should use histograms. And so that claims that we had a majority vote uh, most Americans support us. The largest single group of, uh, uh, of participants in the election in, in, in uh, uh, 2016 actually didn't vote. So they're the biggest group, then the Democrats, then the Republicans, and then a number of other candidates. That, that's in, as, as a bar chart. Yes. Yes. 